Okay, mate, 40 here. I mean, we have built such an amazing relationship, such a relationship based around trust and faith and charity and radical love and inclusion. And so what I want to do tonight is to challenge us to reinvigorate our relationship. So for some people, it will be the first time that they're taking this pledge. And then for other people, it's just renewing a, a gorgeous deeply felt relationship that's already here so please dearly beloved we are gathered here in the sight of god and in the presence of these witnesses we've got two viewers right now to join together right love and inclusion radical love and inclusion we're joining together here to create meaning and to reinforce our commitment to our shared hero system right which is commended to be honorable among all men and therefore is not to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly but reverently discreetly advisedly and solemnly so it is truly a blessing from heaven for us to reinforce here and now that what we know is real and true and good and beautiful really is real true good and beautiful and it's not just some artificial construction of what is real true good and beautiful right that we are somehow imposing upon reality just to make ourselves feel better and and to feel like we have some you know special place in the cosmos because as you know we really do have the truth and we really know here that others live in the lie right they live in darkness they are of their father the devil and the lust of their father they will do right we can't sustain our understanding of what is real true good and beautiful on our own Right? We need each other to create meaning. So everything that is precious to us dissolves without reinforcement from society. So all hierarchies, all standards of right and wrong, all values, all hero systems are socially constructed. But of course, no one can live that way. We all believe that our hero system is true and real and beautiful and good. But if you step back, yeah, it's socially constructed. Now, we don't want to return to a state of nature. That would rob us of everything sacred so verily verily i say unto you this day winter is coming we must all hang together or we shall all hang separately are you with me press one if you are with me all right let us speak frankly a different culture and our group is always a menace to us because it is a living example that life can go on heroically within a value framework totally alien to our own right these other cultures Right? These other ways of life, these other hero systems, they threaten to invade our thinking and they threaten to reveal the fictional nature of our own culture that maybe what we believe is real, true, good, and beautiful is just a social construct. So these outgroups, all right, they are undermining our hero system and thereby they are reducing us to the status of animals among animals. Are you going to put up with that? I know I'm not going to put up with that. So. When I bring you into the virtual community you're about to possess, and when I drive before you many cultures, many vlogs, many blogs, many channels, right? Channels larger and stronger than you. And when I've delivered them all over to you and you have defeated them, you must destroy them totally, right? Make no treaty with these other live streamers. Show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your children away from following me to serve other hero systems. And my anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. So this is what you are to do to them. You must challenge their credibility. You must challenge their facts and logic. You must raid their live streams. You must burn down their idols. For you are a holy people. I have chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be my people, my precious, my precious. I am grooming you for great things. So vlogging what we're doing right now it is the promise of hope between two people who love each other sincerely who honor each other as individuals and who wish to unite their lives and share the future together so in this ceremony we dedicate ourselves to the happiness and well-being of each other in a union of mutual caring and responsibility so will you take this live stream to be your lawfully wedded live stream in sickness and in health in good times and in bad till death do you part amen so the critics who dispute the fairness or the legitimacy of our virtual community 
we will conceptually liquidate them through the counter charge that their criticisms are just sour grapes style resentment in the face of their failures to gain entry into our thing. As the philosopher Ronnie Goldman teaches us, what had been a threat to institutional legitimacy is thereby translated into an affirmation of our institutional legitimacy because the social meaning of their outsiders critique, their outgroup critique of us now resides in the chip on their shoulder that highlights the desirability of the very thing that they're criticizing. So please join together with me, taught by our joys, by our own sorrows, even by our failures, that in vlogging and blogging, as in all of life, whosoever insists upon saving their lesser goods and their little self shall miss what is greater. But whosoever forgets themselves in devotion to this virtual live stream, to their beloved, to their precious, and in consecra consecration to our common hero system, is sure as to find a full and happy life. There are no ties on earth so sweet, none so tender as those that you're about to assume. There are no vows so solemn as those you are about to make. There is no institution of earth so sacred as that of the union that we will form. For the true home is not only the place in which we will live, but it is also the dwelling place where each lives in the heart and mind of the other. I mean, did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear of clouds unfold. Bring me my chariots of fire. I don't know about you, but I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Are you with me? <laughs> well, I'm not going to let live, nine members of my, my live stream, I, I'm not going to allow that, that intoxication to, to blind me to, to what we're, we're building here. I, I'm not going to lose myself knowing that, wow, there are nine people listening right now. I mean, they, they just... They just took the pledge, all right? And, and this is a pledge for life. You, you can't get out of this. All right, so in reality, most of us don't really have much capacity to treat the suffering, oppression, and the legal inequality of individuals or groups who we see as obstacles to our own goals and our own visions, right? Those outgroups with whom we feel little affinity, we, 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 we don't treat them as real, all right? We don't treat their suffering as real. We don't lose sleep about their suffering. For us, they are just abstractions or exaggerations. They're not concrete people, right? So dominant groups don't, and we're dominant, right? This is an alpha crowd. We don't have the inclination or the ability to be fully aware of those we are dominating, right? Dominant groups such as us, we don't consider ourselves to be oppressive, right? We live in a, in a society eh, where tolerance for diversity is valued. All right, so whatever we achieve, that's just natural and good and beautiful and true and justified. All right, so if if we were to examine our white privilege, all right, if if we are to absolve our dominant group of any responsibility for inequality, and therefore from bearing any of the costs of ameliorating inequality, right, the, the, there's just no motivation for us to question our privilege. So. People on the left, they hold themselves out as egalitarians who demand only universal autonomy and a more equitable distribution of resources. But every dominant class in history has sought to legitimate itself through some idealistic framework or another. The, the feudal lord maintained his dominion for the betterment of the serfs. The priest exercised his own special privileges for the betterment of the sinners. Lords and priests didn't view themselves as the dominant class, as having privilege. They were no less than the peasant they're just simply subordinated to the divine order in which everyone was only playing their own s small role. So let's talk about the harm principle. That's the libertarian position, and it's also held by much of the left, that the state may only regulate harmful as opposed to merely immoral conduct. Right? This is a trusty weapon in the arsenal of liberalism. So let's say the nice bloke next door is regularly having sexual intercourse with his mother. Now, that's not harming you, yet 
I suspect you would find that upsetting and disturbing. You would feel that it's doing harm to you, but it'd be hard to articulate. If the brother and sister down the street are having regular sexual intercourse, how is that harming you? But you experience it as a harm. So conservative defenders say of marriage as being just between a man and a woman, they have a hard time articulating how same-sex marriage is harming them, right? Right? So it's hard to articulate, for example, how pornography contributes to the degradation of our society. So our traditional arguments are generally dismissed by those on the left as rationalizations for moralistic motivations. So the harm principle almost always yields to liberal prescriptions. Now, here is the counter argument from the traditional side. People get their satisfaction and their happiness from living in a particular kind of community. This is a particular kind of community. We come here to reinforce for each other what we understand to be true, good, beautiful, what's right and, and what's wrong. Right? We're, we're dissidents in the larger community. We, we feel the heel of the liberal left jackboot on our necks. And so we gather together here to give each other strengths. So... Like everyone, we get our satisfaction and our happiness from living in a particular kind of community, even when that community is virtual. Right? So any conduct that subverts our community, our thing, our group, reduces our happiness, and thereby it inflicts harm upon us. And so knowing the guy next door is regularly buggering his mother, right, that reduces my happiness. I feel harmed by that. That's like an aggressive mood, even if I never see it or hear from it, and I can't point concretely to a direct harm. It's just incredibly icky. It, it disturbs me. Yeah, I don't want to slide down the slippery slope of uh, degeneracy. Right? And if, if a, you know, a, a brother down the block is regularly having sex with his sister, that harms me. It's an aggressive sort of harm, even if I never see it. Just knowing that that's happening on my boss, that, that icky incest is going on on my block, it harms me because I get my joy and my satisfaction, my happiness and my meaning in life from living in a particular kind of community where that is forbidden. So liberals and people on the left think they're so rational, right? They, they are not moved. They're not impressed by our traditional premonitions about the erosion or unraveling of the social order, which things like uh, same-sex marriage and transsexual rights bring about. Right? So people on the left dismiss our moral urges as an inadequate basis for resisting changes that satisfy immediate needs and urgent de desires. This is Amy Wax. So our vague premonitions of the erosion or unraveling of standards and of society they're supposed to be just symptoms of a lingering pre-modern sensibility, right? And we simply haven't grown up, right? And we cannot be permitted to interfere with liberals' more tangible concerns with assisting modern fulfillment. So just as Blackman's dissent in Bowers versus Hardwick argue that homosexuality in and of itself involves no real interference the rights of others. The, the mere knowledge that other individuals do not adhere to our value system cannot be a legally cognizable interest, but we feel it, right? We feel it in our guts, even if it's hard to articulate, right? If incest is going on, even though it's all consensual and it's among adults and ostensibly no one's being harmed, we feel harmed. So how do we frame our opposition, for example, to same-sex marriage, right? So is it just some kind of Hobbesian annoyance? Or is it a an important disequilibrium in the order of things? So the left-wing philosopher Martha Nussbaum at the University of Chicago claims, what inspires disgust is typically the male thought of the male homosexual imagined as anally penetrable. So is this the, the basis of your homophobia that you've got you know, feelings of disgust at the idea of some of the men getting anally penetrated? Are you bothered by the idea of semen and feces mixing together inside the body of a male? Is this one of the most disgusting ideas imaginable? All right. It, do you have the idea that the non-penetrability of your anus is some kind of sacred boundary against stickiness, ooze, and death? And so the presence of one homosexual male in your neighborhood, does that inspire the thought that you might lose your own clean safeness, that you might unwittingly become the receptacle of these animal products? 
So is your disgust ultimately disgust at one's own imagined anal penetrability and ooziness? And is this why the male homosexual is regarded with disgust and viewed with fear as a predator who might make everyone else disgusting? Right, so have you simply not grown up and not come to accept the harm principle? Right? There's a male homosexual on your block. You know, why do you care if he's getting anally penetrated? You know, why are you so grossed out at the idea of semen and feces mixing together in his anus? So Martha Nussbaum wants to expel the language of shame and disgust from the public sphere. She wants us to graduate to a certain level of human recognition, right? She wants us to move into the psychological foundations of liberalism, right? And they will be fully realized in a society that acknowledges its own humanity. Are you simply, is your homophobia springing from an inability to acknowledge your own humanity, right? Are you trying to hide from your humanity, right? Maybe in a fully realized liberal society, we'll have a group of citizens who will willing to admit that they are needy and vulnerable and might get anally penetrated every now and again, right? Like people who are straight, they just, they just have anal sex with guys every so often and come down with monkeypox because straight people can get monkeypox too. Like straight people who, you know, who are men who sometimes have anal sex with other men. I mean, largely straight, almost always straight, except for when they're getting buggered, right? So do we need to develop a society of citizens who are willing to admit that they are needy and vulnerable? And are they willing to just simply discard the grandiose demands for omnipotence and completeness that have been at the heart of so much human misery, both public and pri private? So the psychological foundations of liberalism, and this is from Ronnie Goldman's terrific book on conservophobia, conservative claims of cultural oppression, the nature and origins of conservophobia. So what are the psychological foundations of liberalism? It's a discipline that we impose on our emotional lives. It subdues the symbolic elements that do not reliably track the kind of harms that are cognized from a non-anthropocentric standpoint, right? So the psychological foundations from the liberal perspective involve the self-discipline to transcend your maleness, your anthropocentricity, to transcend the auto human need to embed oneself within an order that would lift one above the mere animal and infuse one with a greater fullness of being. So people have traditionally achieved this transcendence through religion and adherence to traditional hero systems. But are you willing to expose yourself psychologically to the reality of your animal vulnerability? Are you willing to disavow the culturally sustained hierarchies of the pure and the impure, the normal and the abnormal, right? That's what the denial of vulnerability depends upon. Now, if you askew these hierarchies, you prepare to see the world naturally as simply an agglomeration of vulnerable organisms just making their way in the world. And some people need to go to a bathhouse and hook up with a bunch of randos and come down with monkeypox and other people get married and stay faithful to their spouses and raise kids. So are you ready for this kind of natural disengagement? It allows you to understand disgust non-anthropocentrically, right? Just as an evolved mechanism that might have once served as a reliable indicator of bacteria or a reliable indicator of fear of monkeypox. But we know that once you get PrEP and the vaccine for monkeypox, this sense of disgust, it now functions as a highly unreliable indicator of genuine threats to our welfare. So we get our meaning and purpose in life from a hero system where this kind of behavior is heroic and this kind of behavior is disgusting and this is right and this is wrong and we all play a special role in the cosmos. So we depend upon a society regulating social meaning in accordance with these traditional strictures. So the traditionalists resist the open inclusion of gays in the military because this inclusion you know, threatens our whole sense of meaning. It threatens what we have always understood what it means to be a military man, right? So a military man in history was, you know, unambiguously male, strong, disciplined, emotionless, and heterosexual. So the inclusion of gays who get stereotyped as effeminate, weak, and irresolute, that alters the whole social meaning of membership in the military. It completely deprives it of traditional connotations. So even if one, no one was compelled to affirm that gays have a rightful place in the military 
or is kept from opining to the contrary, the open inclusion of gays establishes a new social meaning. It establishes a new orthodoxy. It alters the background of social meanings in the context of which opinions are shaped and social meanings that we as individuals cannot help but encounter and which we must essentially submit to. Now, the individual might continue to posit the military enterprise is essentially heterosexual, but this judgment is no longer built into the intrinsic meaning of our society, the way that ideals of discipline and obedience used to be. So what is a hero system? Right. A, a society is a symbolic action system, says Ernest Becker. It is a structure of statuses and roles, customs and rules of behavior designed to serve as a vehicle for earthly heroism. All right, We all want to be the heroes in our own story. Each script is unique. Each culture has a different hero system. And the presence of so many different hero systems in our midst threatens to reduce our allegiance to the hero system that we believe in. So anthropologists call this cultural relativity, right? It's the reality that there are hero systems, different hero systems the world over. And each culture cuts out roles for earthly heroics. So each Society cuts out roles for performances of varying degrees of heroism, from the high heroism of a Winston Churchill, a Mao, or a Buddha, to the low heroism of the coal miner, the peasant, the simple priest, the plain, everyday, earthy heroism wrought by gnarled working hands guiding a family through hunger and disease. Now, it doesn't matter if our cultural hero system is magical, religious, primitive, secular, scientific, and civilized. Right? We cannot live without a mythical hero system in which we serve this hero system to earn a feeling of value, of being special, of, of having a special role in the universe, right? That we are ultimately useful to creation. And this is what gives us unshakable meaning. Without a society giving us a hero system, we don't have meaning, purpose, and happiness, right? So we get to earn this feeling of cosmic specialness by carving out our own place in nature, by building edifices that reflect our values, a temple, a cathedral, a synagogue, a totem pole, skyscraper, a family that lasts many generations. So we create things that we hope will last for a long time and that they will have meaning and they will outlive and outshine death and decay. They will outlive and outshine us. So no matter how scientific or secular our society claims to be, we cannot live without a hero system. We cannot live without hopeful belief that uh, the things that we do count for more than a musician in the making contemporary America must commit himself to music with an emotional intensity that was completely unnecessary in 19th century Vienna, precisely because in the American situation right now, there is a powerful competition from what will subjectively appear as the materialistic and mass culture of the rat race. So religious training in a pluralistic situation demands a, a reality accentuation and an intensity that are unnecessary in a situation dominated by a religious monopoly. So if you want a coherent, cohesive society, you think it would be easier just to have one dominant religion, all right? Because as soon as you have multiple religions, it casts into doubt the truth of your own religion, right? It's natural to become a Catholic priest in Rome that is not natural in America. So American theological seminaries and Orthodox Jewish institutions have to constantly cope with the problem of reality slippage. And they have to constantly devise techniques for making stick the traditional reality, right? They have to accentuate reality, right? You need techniques of reality accentuation to keep going in directions that are not blessed by the society around you. So people who are not left liberal secular, they need to operate with reality accentuation. And that's what this show is all about. We're here about accentuating the reality of what is true, good, and beautiful. All right, the meanings that sustain us, that sustain our whole understanding of ourselves, of the world, of the cosmos, of what is true, good, and beautiful, these meanings won't work if they're recognized as simply things that we have made up, if they're just fictions of our mind, if they're just socially constructed, all right, then they lose all their power. Right? What we believe in must be upheld as transcendent, as you know, cosmic divine truth. 
right? If our life is based upon the, the vagaries of human predilection and, and human construction, then it's not going to hold any power over us, right? We need our meaning ultimately to spring from, spring from the transcendent and from God. So we depend upon others to uphold an order of things, a meaning system, a, a hero system upon which we all depend, right? We don't merely entertain an understanding of what is right and wrong and true and good and beautiful. We depend upon each other in society to construct that and to share that. So our relations depend upon sharing a, a similar hero system to share a sense of what's significant and what needs to be sustained. Now, deviant voices don't necessarily upset the order of things, but they, they have the potential to upset us. They, they eat away at our conviction that what we believe to be true, good, and beautiful is the way it really is, right? It's the way we've always taken it to be. And that therefore, we are who we believe ourselves to be. Our self-identity, our meaning in life, our purpose, our happiness depends upon believing a particular story. And the multiplication of stories and hero systems out there will eat away at our belief in the truth and goodness and divinity of the story that we live our life by. And so all these other systems are those other live streams, guys. Those other live streams, they're eating away at your sense of reality, right? They, they, if you have an unguarded moment on some other live stream, it could call you to reality slip. Man, you will slip away from what you understand to be true, good, and beautiful, right? Because these other live streamers, they might go off script, then you might go off script, and they might upset the plausibility of the narrative against which you live your life, and, and which gives you an identity. And so with all the hero systems out there, all the stories out there, all right, the greater the chances that you'll go nuts, right? So... Just like in a movie, our identities engross us only to the degree that they fit with a particular story, right? We need narrative coherence. We need a story that works for us and not just works for us, that we believe to be true. And we need a story that is established and preserved. And we need to fight off stories that undercut what we believe to be true, good, and beautiful, right? We need story. We need narrative coherence. And these things provide us with moral order. And without moral order, then we have no nothing governing our lives and telling us who we are. So just as Blackman says, oh, the mere knowledge that other individuals don't adhere to one's value system, you know, going out there committing sodomy, that presents a very real threat. It's not just an isolated piece of information. It's a data point that resists our story, our narrative that sustains our life. So all this deviant behavior out there, Right? All those icky other live streamers, they're contaminating our story, our data set, our vital bodily fluids. They are eating away at the foundation of our life. Right? One culture, Ernest Becker says this, one culture is always a potential menace to another culture because a different hero system, a different culture, a different story is a living, breathing example that life can go on heroically within a value framework totally alien to our own value framework. And so all these other stories and live streamers out there and communities, right, they are revealing the fictional nature of our own story. Right? They are undermining the necessary preconditions of our hero system. And they are, therefore, they are reducing us to the status of animals among animals. And do you really want to be just an animal among animals? So the whole point of culture is to give us identity and purpose and a hero system. Right? We only become acutely aware of this in response to whatever threatens it, such as the traditionalists, it's same-sex marriage, the, the trans movement, and other forms of, of deviancy from traditional morality. So we can try to neutralize these threats right, through conceptual liquidation. We, we can say that these threats are an inferior status. They are not to be taken seriously. And so we can translate threats to our story by, by using concepts from our symbolic universe, right? So 
their attempts to negate our story will just subtly change that into an affirmation of our story. So those who dispute the fairness or legitimacy of our story, we can conceptually liquidate them. Don't harm them. Don't, don't lay a finger on their shoulder. Right? But we're just going to charge that their criticisms are just sour grape style resentment in the face of their failure to gain entry into our thing. So liberals have this self-image that they're just strategic agents, that they have cast off the confining, you know, ultimate teleological distortions of the past. But this is a distortion of what human beings are like. Right? We all depend upon a hero system. Right? We've all been cemented and harnessed to a particular way of life and to a particular story and a particular hero system. Right? So we get a good feeling for what is good and who we are. Right? So imagine that we are contained in, in a, the cylinder of our body, like an amoeba, and we're constantly pushing outside of our body the, the pseudopods from an amoeba to a spouse, to a car, a flag, a crushed flower in a secret book. Right? I remember there was this woman that I loved when I went back to Gladstone, Australia, when I was 18, and there was one night I was walking down Gundoon Street in Gladstone, Friday night, and I saw this woman that I was crazy about, and uh, she called out to me from the other side of the street, and uh, I met up with her, and we, we started walking, we walked down to the harbor, and I got her to write down her phone number on a chewing gum wrapper, and I kept that chewing gum wrapper for years, right? It, it had so much meaning for me. Now, I think she later died in a drunk driving accident, but just imagine yourself as an amoeba, and everything that's true, good, and important to you is spreading out over the landscape. Right? Its boundaries keep extending far from our own center. Now, if you destroy that gum wrapper where I have Rachel's phone number on it, right, you are doing tremendous harm to me. Right? If you tear and burn down the American flag, you, you're killing me. Right? I'll scream out with soul-searing pain. Right? So... We extend ourselves to all sorts of things we hold dear and also all sorts of silly things, things that we supposedly don't need, just artificial things like our car. I remember how much I loved my first car. It was a 1968 Volkswagen Bug. And I cleaned that and I polished that and I vacuumed that. I took such good care of it. And then looking down while changing the station on my radio, I ran smack into a parked school bus one morning and just did tremendous damage to my Volkswagen. And it was just so upsetting. I had invested so much. I loved so much my first car. And then I wrecked it. And it was like part of me ha had been destroyed. Right? And that's normal, right? We, we tend to get attached to our cars and not just transportation mechanisms, right? We tend to get attached to our interior decorating, right? If you came and you ripped down my posters, my soul would scream out. Right, we, we get vitally upset by a piece of wallpaper that bulges, a shelf that does not join, a, a light fixture that isn't right, a, a sound system that, that you know, has distortions in it. Right? So you'll see someone who you think is high functioning and they'll break into violent arguments or even start crying over a panel that doesn't match, over wallpaper that ha has a bulge. Right? So interior decorators can find that many people have dramatic symptoms and nervous breakdowns during redecorating because it's an extension of us. Right? I've seen a grown a silver templed Italian, says uh, Ernest Becker here, crying into the street in his mother's arms over a small dent in the bumper of his Ferrari. Right? That's how we roll. Right now, we call certain people strong if they can you know, withdraw their pseudopod at will from trifling parts of their identity. Right, people who can say, "Oh, it's only a scratch on a Ferrari," or that uneven wall—that's not me. The wood crack is not me. Right, people who can disentangle themselves easily and flexibly from the little damages and ravages to their self-extension. But there is this huge discrepancy between our actual lived experience and our cultural self-understanding. Right, the liberal view is that we're just disengaged strategic agents maneuvering within a neutral environment, denuded of cosmic and super-individual significance. And all these preoccupations with bulging wallpaper and disjointed shelves, they're just quintessentially modern. They're just white people problems, right? But we can't escape that, 
right? You, you can, you know, strategically pursue modern fulfillment in another man's asshole, right? But we all have a sensed order of things. We all believe in a hero system. We all believe in a story. And when people damage our story or defecate on our story, that rips us up inside, right? That That's depriving us of the conditions under which we know who we are and under which we can thrive and live and love and, and have our being, right? So it's really hard to withdraw our pseudopods from what seem like just mere trifles on the outside. So in real life, we are not disengaged strategic agents, right? All our calculations and all our planning depends upon our hero system and our story, right? We, we're not looking upon an external world through, through the windows of ourselves from the isolation of our own ego. We're already outside of ourselves. We know ourselves by our perceptions of what's outside of ourselves, right? We're not just in the world. We are involved in it, right? Existence is to stand outside of oneself, to be beyond oneself. This is Martin Heidegger. My being is not something that just takes place inside my skin. My being is spread over this entire virtual community, over fields, over hills, over dales. My meaning will never fail, right? Our being consists of the entire world that we care ourselves about. Right? This is Martin Heidegger's theory of man and of being. You could call it the field theory of man. We live by our understanding of the world out there and our participation in it. So we don't encounter the world as a disengaged strategic agent, right? Without a place in the larger order, without a hero system, without a story, we are unintelligible to ourselves. We don't understand who we are. We cannot just readily alter social meanings at will. When social meanings get altered, this is incredibly upsetting. Our understanding of ourself originates in social meaning. So a meaning is first encountered out there in the world, not just in some kind of disembodied, you know, interior sensation. So this liberal ethos of disengaged self-control and self-reflexivity is a form of engagement, right? Its contours are structured by what's going on in how we experience reality in our story. And, and reality will either slip or be accentuated on the basis of change in social conditions and chance. So the liberal idea of kind of disengaged reflexivity of the strategic agent, it produces a sensation that the self resides somewhere inside of one's skin. But it doesn't. It exists outside of us and inside of us. Right? Social meanings constrain us because they give us our story, they give us our identity. To preserve our identity is to contain our freedom, to limit the range of life possibilities that one can seriously contemplate. You may think that you just can't contemplate going to a gay bathhouse and having sex with 20 random dudes. Right? To even consider that possibility would destroy your sense of self. Right, This narrow story is the sine qua non of taking yourself seriously. And that's what social meaning allows us to maintain. If we had social meaning and all these hero systems that we could just choose, you know, one, one day and another, another day, right? That destroys us. We're no longer a force to be reckoned with. Like, so hero systems are not idle symbolic luxuries. They're not just intangible cultural concerns. They are a biological necessity. We can't live without a hero system. Now, conservatives are emphatic in their warnings about same-sex marriage and how it threatens the basic institution of marriage, but they've always had a hard time explaining how this should be. How does the presence of the same-sex couple next door possibly impinge on the stability of one's own marriage. So the liberal reflex has always been to dismiss the conservative point of view as just thinly disguised mean spiritedness, just the symptom of some acknowledged fear or anxiety that has been taken out on those who have nothing to do with the conservatives' real problems, which are being disguised in ostensible worries about the preservation of the traditional family. Right? This is why the, the benighted conservative must grow and uh, must, must become aware, can't just uh, keep living in this benighted state, needs the vision of the anointed. Now, 
People on the left acknowledge the destruction of the family is precisely their aim, right? The same-sex marriage will destroy the family. That's the whole point. Lesbian activist Marsha Gessen taught a sympathetic audience, gay marriage is a lie. Fighting for gay marriage means lying about what we're going to do with marriage when we get there. It's a no-brainer that the institution of marriage should not exist, right? Marriage equality becomes marriage elasticity with the ultimate goal of marriage extinction. Right? This is Marsha Gessen, lesbian activist. Right? From the liberal point of view, marriage equality becomes marriage elasticity with the ultimate goal of marriage extinction. So Marsha Gessen says, I have three kids who have five parents, and I don't see why they shouldn't have five parents legally. I met my new partner, and she just had a baby. That baby's biological father is my brother, and my daughter's biological father is a man who lives in Russia. My adopted son also considers him his father. So the five parents break down into two groups of three. Really, I would like to live in a legal system that is capable of reflecting that reality, and I don't think that's compatible with the institution of marriage. So marriage elasticity is all about marriage extinction. Right, And they're not trying to make traditional 1950s-style nuclear family criminal, but this elasticity destroys the hero system that has underpinned the traditional family. It has deprived the institution of its traditional social meaning. So the family being targeted by the homosexual agenda is not the bare practices of cohabitation, financial independence, and child-rearing by legally bound adults. It's the hero system of social conservatives. It's the thick structure of aspirational roles invoked by talk of traditional family values. This is what conservatives are referring to when they warn the family is under attack. And so the institution of same-sex marriage carries implications for heterosexual couples. Traditional marriage has become but one possible interpretation of a civil institution. It is no longer its intrinsic and uncontested meaning. Right? You really don't want that upon which you build your life to have a contested meaning. So in the new order, heterosexual marriage constitutes not same-sex marriage constitutes not merely an expansion of rights, but a whole change in social meaning. It upsets social plausibility. It disrupts the resonance of traditional understandings of marriage. It disrupts the traditional interpretation of marriage. So as marriage becomes socially understood as just another agreement rather than a sacred rite, a sacrament, its value is viewed as residing in individual sentiments rather than in a transcendent dispensation that ratifies these sentiments. So traditionalists are threatened with a different interpretation of themselves. They're confronted with the possibility of that which they regard as sacred, right? That this just comes out of their own idiosyncratic emotions and has no ultimate or societal meaning. Now, they can assert whatever they want about the legal status of same-sex marriage, but marriages, heterosexual traditional marriages like their own, you know, can still truly count in the eyes of God. But this interpretation is now contested and social meanings are challenged and changed. So the meaning that traditionalists would like to imbue their marriages with will no longer carry the same meaning in reality. They want to imbue a certain meaning into their marriage, but the existence of same-sex marriage undercuts that. So this is why conservatives worry about left-wing attacks on the family. So this is a relativizing of the epistemically objective into the ontological subjective, right? Liberals are trying to dissolve the power of heretofore taken for granted social meanings by highlighting their contingent, meaning constructed, socially constructed origins in the coordinated meaning generated activities of human beings, the recognition of which compels people to take these meanings less seriously. Once you understand that everything that you believe is contingent and constructed, you will start to take everything you believe less seriously. So. Conservatives respond with outrage, incredu in incredulity, right? All right, we, we don't just morally disagree, all right? We don't just have a different version of the good, all right? So for a left-wing perspective, you know, we are benighted. We are still existing in pre-reflective social meanings. So the subtext of liberals' outrage is that we can subtract the traditional human experience and traditional 
social meanings, and conservatives are guilty of ha having failed to do so. But this subtraction is impossible. It's a cultural fiction. So conservatives' vague premonitions of erosion or unraveling refers to the erosion and unraveling of something real, something on which human beings depend upon, which they do really encounter as an independent object, forces to be reckoned with. So liberals' outraged incredulity about traditional morality is intended to deny this. So the purpose of this liberal denial is not just to condemn conservatives morally, but basically to impugn their basic competence as human agents, to highlight their failure to realize their human essence as strategic agents liberated from the confining horizons of a benighted past. So where the benighted traditionalist speaks of some ethereal social fiber, the postmodern sophisticate speaks of social constructions. But the underlying referent is the exact same. We all have a hero system. We all depend on a story. We all have socially sustained meanings that fortify us in our identity. So this is what conservatives defend, and this is what liberals attack. So follow, following the lead of Martha Nussbaum, liberals dismiss opposition to same-sex marriage as a symptom of a narcissistic fear and aggression woken by anxiety about changes that elude our control and loss of control over cherished values. Now, liberals can recognize, if they try, this same kind of narcissistic fear and aggression is not just unique to social conservatives, it is a human constant that works itself out in a great many ways, either crudely or subtly, and without any overt religious or moralistic trappings. So liberals can recognize in theoretical context uh, that are quickly forgotten in heated political ones that uh, conservatives are judged according to ideals or strategic agency that no one would be prepared to apply consistently. Conservatives have a visceral conviction that liberal culture is holding them down through oppressive dualisms and double standards. So liberals urge us to recognize the human constants that undermine the dualisms that this disingenuousness has facilitated Right now, this is conservatives to recognize the symmetries that go unacknowledged by liberal culture. So for people on the left, it's a great mystery. Why do so many people in America still vote Republican? So why do voters subordinate their sub substantial material interests to symbolic interests, right? This has been a decisive factor in left-wing critiques of the of Republicans since the Nixon years, when Republicans first began invoking symbolic concerns in an appeal to Southerners and to working class voters. So liberals are exasperated with conservatives' preoccupation with intangible and merely symbolic goods like national honor, the moral fiber of society, and so forth. So we have this sharp dichotomy between the symbolic and the substantive, according to liberals. This is a way of articulating the subtraction account inspired contraposition between superstition, superstitious pre-moderns just self-indulgently succumbing to the allures of inherited teleological regimes and self-critical moderns with the discipline to resist these temptations and direct their attention toward natural causality and its bearing on fulfillment. So conservatives from a left-wing perspective are governed by the passions while liberals are governed by their interests. But this whole ethos of disengaged self-control and self-reflexivity is not invoked when it comes to liberals' own merely cultural preoccupations. So liberals have no difficulty recognizing the serious of the symbolic in the context of multiculturalism. So here it is, conservatives who reduce the symbol, some kind of socioeconomic frustration, to free-floating, self-indulgent, identitarian preoccupations uprooted from the harsh truths of everyday life in the real world. So Thomas Sowell observes, the world of the anointed anointed is a very tidy place so every deviation of the real world from the tidiness of their vision is considered to be someone's fault so unfulfilled yearnings and chafing inhibitions have no place in this tidy world of the anointed where even an inadequate supply of group heroes and historic group achievements is someone else's fault so people on the left are always talking about oh you know lack of role models for minorities when the left does this they're recognizing we all need hero systems we all need a story and somehow this lack of heroes for this and that minority group is the fault of the historians. So the left understands that reality is socially constructed and therefore can be deconstructed and reassembled to one's heart's desires. So if the number of black scientists and inventors acknowledged in high school history textbooks is of sufficient importance to the self-esteem, therefore the long-term life prospects of black students, 
as to qualify as substantial rather than simply symbolic, then why should the question of whether America was at its inception a Christian nation be dismissed as a distraction from the bona fide substantive interests of religious conservatives? Is there not a double standard here? Of course there is. The line between the symbolic and the substantive appears to have been drawn in the service of liberal ideology. So why are so many liberals obsessed with whether there is prayer at a school graduation or whether the local town hall has a Christian creche? What possible harm is being done? Well, the liberals object because placing a crash in town hall is purely symbolic, but it's a symbol that the left wants to remove. So what the left keeps talking about is merely symbolic is really the particular range of cultural preoccupations associated with conservative claims of cultural oppression. So when conservatives have the upper hand on a cultural issue, then liberals insist that only bread and butter issues are the serious issues. But when liberals are on the offense, it's all about racial quotas the mainstream of gay culture, scrubbing the public square of Christianity and other explicitly cultural ambitions. So sometimes liberals and conservatives both deny symbolic cultural grievances and they are tangible only when they are voiced in the terms of ordinary Americans or when they are celebrated as idealism or insight when conveyed in the professional lingo of credentialed academic elites. So Symbolic cultural grievances are uh, not real when they are voiced by ordinary Americans, but they are real when they are celebrated as idealism and insight when done in the professional lingo of the academic elite. So liberals have been projecting their own vices onto conservatives. So they are trying to deny their own status as symbolic animals seeking cosmic specialness through a socially sustained hero system. That's what we are. We're all symbolic animals. We are all seeking cosmic specialness through a socially sustained hero system, and therefore we find it painful when our hero system is undercut. So the whole fabric of our experience is structured by a socially sustained sense of transcendence. The modern liberal identity is just another hero system in disguise. It is a social practice that celebrates certain identities while denying and discrediting others. It Robert strengthens Wright, the Mickey hypothesis Kals. of this being about jealousy and rivalry. I didn't realize that if you list, if you go to Wikipedia uh, and see who it says, the three people it says do get the most credit, not that they deserve the most credit, but the three people who do get more credit than him for uh, the, the, the COVID vaccines, um, one of them is co-founder of Moderna, which did the one big mRNA vaccine. And the other, and one of the other ones is a vice president at BioNTech, which collaborated with Pfizer to produce the Pfizer vaccine. So right. it really is his most intense rivals who are getting rich and famous. I mean, one of these is this woman who is probably gets the most media attention as, as inventor. So I didn't- Talking about this uh, anti-vax scientist. I didn't quite realize how closely uh, his, his rivalries align with the vaccines themselves. Right. So it's not, it's not that he is falsifying his role in- inventing the vaccine since he has a legitimate role and that just makes him all the more jealous. Well, yeah, I, what I said at the end was, you know, people are acting as if Malone acts as if, uh, you know, you should believe him on this subject because he really did make this super important seminal contribution. His detractors seem to agree that the question of his credibility is related to the question of his uh, credentials in the sense of how seminal he was because they keep trying to undermine the claim. Robert and I said they both may have it wrong. And maybe the reason you shouldn't trust him is because he really did make such a seminal contribution <laughs> that this thing is driving him fucking nuts. <laughs> I, I think it works that way sometimes. I mean, you know, all the seminal yeah. contributions I have made, not gotten credit for, and how that has driven me crazy, right? Uh, all too well. Um, I rest so, my case. Uh, um, I think you're holding together very well, given really you're sliding by history. A lesser um, man, a lesser man would have gone on the Joe Rogan show. But I've said, no, Joe, I'd love to. I'd love to. But I don't want to, you know, I, it's not about credit. I'm, I say, and, and I've, I've said this to Joe, Joe, the less you care about credit, the more you'll get done in this world. Um, I said that to Joe. But you didn't cite Ronald Reagan. That's the usual. Um, Ronald? It's, it's, sure. I said, I, 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 mentioned, with... I talked, I, I, I talked to Ron about this. Yeah, it's, he said um, it to me before he said it publicly. Ron got this from me. You know, I don't get enough credit for that. The, um, it's weird how the vax has now become. Anytime anybody dies, everybody thinks, uh, did he just get a booster shot? They say that about Bob Sackett. Uh, they said that about Betty White. I had a friend who died, and uh, it was my second thought was, wait. Well, had all these people just gotten boosters? I think maybe Sackett had. Betty White, they said, uh, the answer is I don't know, actually. But would they tell you if they that did? That would be helpful data. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to try to do a probability assessment here. Um, anyway, um, I learned something about Bob Sackett. Oh, uh, the comedian. It turns out he, he was a nice guy. But his fellow comedians thought he was way too dirty and not funny because he was too dirty and they didn't understand 
why he was so fucking dirty. So, I, uh, they, they didn't like the, his stick in the aristocrats either. His stick, his stick in the aristocrats, as I think I said last week, unless I told you this afterwards, his version of the joke was so revolting yeah. and he kept laughing. When I saw the movie, I guess I said this last week, when I saw the movie, I thought there was something pathetic and desperate about him, like trying to be one of the cool kids. Um, you know, because he, he was burdened with this, with the, kind of the opposite image. He this was good guy he, image, yeah. he was Ameri the host of America's Home Videos and he's here to chuckle with America's families and he's host of this benign show, whatever it was called, Full House. I mean, I mean he's in this show, Full House. And I thought or, The Aristocrats was his attempt to compensate I, for that. No, I don't think, it wasn't like Miley Cyrus trying to counteract her Disney image by, by you know, twerking or whatever she did. Um, it's uh, it, it, apparently, I think his, his love of filth uh, long predated his appearance in Full House. I think he just always liked uh, disgusting humor. You know, I'm a nice guy. They all said he was a nice guy. I'm going to try to track down my grievance about American journalism that's related to Bob Saget because I think uh, I'll, I'll be I'll be I'll be working on this while we uh, speak. Uh, um, you, um, I didn't realize you had a grievance on American journalism. <laughs> my grievance, my grievance today is that all the publications that I might agree with on the right, I can't read because they're written in this completely biased, overdone, propagandistic fashion designed to appeal to only people who agree with them. Uh, the classic thing is American greatness. If I see a, if I see an article from American greatness, I just my heart sinks, because it's it's you know it's not going to be written in a way to persuade the unpersuaded. Wait, I might be one of the unpersuaded. Who puts out American they, greatness? I don't know, uh, but there are a bunch of them like that, and they're all like that. Town hall, they're all, they're all. Well, it's a problem on the left too. Yes, Every, but everyone's preaching to the converted in the modern yeah. media environment, except for but, you and me, and we're, that's because nobody's watching. But it's not. Um, but you usually see it directed at the left, and I don't know. From the okay, from I got my grievance. Right. It's a, it's a CNN piece, but it purports to be news. Okay, let's see what uh, Tucker Carlson has to say. So the economy goes south and you want to know what's going on. So you look around for uh, an economist to interview and somehow you find the single most absurd, most discredited economist in the world, Paul Krugman of the New York Times, the guy who told us the internet would be less important than fax machines. But the eunuch over at CNN brought him on because like only the worst. And here's what he said. Can we dispense with the recession debate real quick? Are we in a recession and does the term matter? <laughs> uh, no, we aren't and no, it doesn't. I mean, the- uh, <laughs> One sentence, that was it, huh? Yeah, that was it. Yeah, shut up and eat your bugs. Blake Masters is one of the people who will change the United States Senate if he gets there. He's running from Arizona. His primary, by the way, is tomorrow. He joins us tonight. Blake Masters- Yeah, no, we don't care what uh, politicians have to say. Hey, police are arresting people for, quote, causing anxiety to politically protected groups. They don't care about your anxiety, but the people they do care about must be protected at gunpoint from anxiety. This is video of police in the UK arresting an army veteran for posting criticism of trans activists on social media. Does British Hampshire police would realise how ridiculous this is. It is. Of course, I'm happy to come to this. What, 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 did, what, did, what did it need to come to? Tell, tell us why you escalated it to this level. Because I don't understand. I posted something that he posted. You come to arrest me, you don't arrest him. Why has it come to this? Why am I in cuffs? Because of something he shared, then I shared. Because someone has been caused, obviously, anxiety based upon your social media page. That's not why you've been arrested. Darren, got the Keep in mind, the guy who got arrested didn't hurt anybody. He called those activists fascists. So to prove they're not fascists, they stood by and laughed as he was arrested for making fun of them because they're not fascists. Right. Lawrence Fox is the man who shot the footage you just saw. He's an actor and leader of the British Reclaim Party. He joins us tonight. Lawrence Fox, thanks so much for coming on. Is there anything that we're missing here? Did the guy who was arrested physically attack anybody? Is there context that we don't know about? Uh, good evening, Tucker. No, not at all. Uh, the great tragedy here is that uh, a British Army veteran with a long service record who served in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, proudly served our flag is, is now being arrested for not worshipping at the altar of the Holy Pride flag. And um, it's appalling uh, arrest by the British Gestapo, which is what uh, the British police force has become. I don't think that's an overstatement at all. So the activist groups on whose behalf this was done, did, did they applaud it? Did they lodge a complaint? Did they defend the guy who was arrested for making fun of them? 
No, not at all. What we what we did was once we heard of this uh, gross horribleness uh, being meted out on this man was that we decided that we'd surprise the police and give them a dose of their own medicine, which we did. And we offered them a conflict resolution form where they could pay some money to us so we could teach them the law. But alas, the British police have fallen. They're much too interested in virtue signaling and uh, bowing at the altar of wokery. I hope you fight back savagely. I think everything's at stake. Lawrence Fox, I appreciate your bravery and your willingness to come on tonight. Thank you.